Today's reading is uh, from uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through to 16. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, and it's taken from the New International Version. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself, itself up in love as each part does its work. Good morning. It is great to be with you this weekend and especially to worship with you this morning. It's obvious that I'm among the people of God. Uh, I've seen the love of God in you as you've worshiped in spirit and truth. And it's just an honor to study God's word with you this morning. If you have your Bible and want to keep it open there to Ephesians 4, we'll be studying there. Uh, we will look out of a couple of passages in Matthew, the 13th chapter, to, as kind of an introduction to get to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I appreciate so much your kind hospitality this week. Uh, I appreciate the leadership. I appreciate the elders and the deacons and Jay and Miles and, and all as a congregation for your warm uh, hospitality. Okay. Uh, also, I, uh, I bring you greetings this morning uh, from Fried Hardeman University. Uh, of the colleges and universities associated with the Churches of Christ, thank you gentlemen, uh, associated with the Churches of Christ in the United States, it's the oldest of them. We began in 1869, and in just a couple of weeks, we will finish our 152nd year of higher education. Uh, this fall, we began uh, the semester with a little bit over 2,300 students. And uh, we have had record enrollment six semesters in a row. And uh, one of the things that makes it the most unique place on earth is that of our enrollment, 83% are members of the Church of Christ. 100% of our faculty are members of the Lord's Church. 100% of our academic staff are members of the Lord's Church. So whether a, a young person goes into a classroom or if they are playing in a murals or in a social club or in a dorm residence hall or if they're hanging out on the weekend, uh, they're around others of like faith. And it's absolutely amazing. Uh, and, and so when we, when we describe ourselves, it's two simple words, Christian education. And, uh, and we're, we're thankful to be able to provide Bible classes on, on a, a college level every semester and every undergraduate takes one. Uh, we have daily chapel and uh, then just so many opportunities for mission trips and etc. But also that education piece is very important to us. You know, any mission and the, that touches eternity demands excellence. And so we demand excellence at Freed Hardeman. And so uh, if you want to become a medical doctor, we're one of your best paths to get accepted into med school. If you want to uh, go on into any of the other professional schools, we have a much higher rate than the national average. Uh, most of our acceptance rates are close to 100%. And, uh, and our 
college of business graduates, they take a field exam at graduation that 500 other universities across the United States take. And we finish in the top 93 percentile every year. Our accounting graduates finish in the top 99 percentile. And our finance graduates finish in the top 99 percentile. We have an investment team of 12 students. And they manage a real $1 million. And, uh, and they outperform the professionals every year. Our nurses, uh, we have one of the highest pass rates on the first take of the NCLEX of anywhere in the state of Tennessee out of 51 other universities. And so I, I tell you that to say, you're probably thinking, we're a long way from Tennessee and we're not going to have kids that are there. We have kids from Canada that are there. As a matter of fact, we have kids from all over the United States, from Hawaii, Oregon, California, and then about 10 to 15 uh, other nations outside the United States. So I would say to you, uh, come and visit us. And uh, you will probably love what you see and you'll make lifetime friends there and your faith will deepen while you're there and you'll look back throughout your life and I can almost guarantee you this, you'll say those were the best four years of my life. But I want to invite all of you, and I really mean this, we have one of the largest gatherings of the Church of Christ in the world every year uh, in, in our lectureship. We have about over 3,000 that will gather it's the first week in February. It'll begin on Sunday evening and it'll go through Thursday. And there'll be well over 100 different lessons during that time. And it is absolutely amazing time. I know a few of you come down for it. I've talked with you. But uh, we'd love to have a lot of you to come down for it. And uh, you will have a spiritual feast. And also you'll have a reunion. You'll run into people there uh, that are members of the church that you've known from other places. And, uh, and it's just a rich and wonderful time together. I love the old story. It's a little bit silly, but I love the story of, of the little boy the years ago who his dog was having a puppy. Do you notice that? He thought his dog was having a puppy. And so it came time finally for that, that puppy to be born. And it was close to the end of a day. And he ran down to the local veterinarian and he said, he said, Doc, you got to help me. My dog's about to have her puppy and I don't know what to do. And the old doctor smiled and he said, son... I'm sure everything's going to be all right, but as I walk home, I'll just pass by your little farm there and, and let's take a look at her. And so he came by and the sun was about to set and, and he looked in and the dog was laying on some straw there and, and everything looked good. And he said, son, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll light this lantern. He said, you hold this lantern and we'll just stay here for a little bit and, and I'm sure everything's going to be fine. And sure enough, in, in just a little bit, the first little puppy's born. And that little boy, he's holding that lantern. And you can imagine, he's beaming from ear to ear. He's got his dog that he loves and now the little puppy that, that he's wanted. And he's so happy. And then to his shock, a second puppy is born. And he hadn't thought about having two puppies. And then a third puppy was born. And then a fourth puppy was born. And a fifth puppy. And as a fifth puppy's born, he's thinking, how am I going to take care of all these dogs? I can't take care of all these dogs. And as the sixth puppy's born, he's already getting nervous. He's rocking back and forth. He doesn't know what he's going to do. And as the seventh puppy was born, you hear, and he blows out the lantern. And the doc looks around toward him and he says, son, what are you doing? He says, doc, I think this light's attracting them. You know, I love that idea that for whatever reason, God did make it so that at least bugs are attracted to light. But isn't it awesome to think about on a much more serious note? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, that I will draw all men unto me. Every nationality, every tribe, every tongue. But he has to be lifted up. He was lifted up on the cross for you and I so that our salvation could be a reality. But then he gives his church the great commission to say, now it's your place to go around and lift me up. Our job is just to lift Jesus up. Our job isn't to make people be saved. Our job isn't to make people become believers. Our job is to lift him up. You know, when we think about what God's design is for his people, that design has always been for those people to increase. It's not that you and I aren't valuable and enough. 
It's just simply that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You remember in Matthew the 13th, what did I just do? Open your Bibles to Matthew the 13th chapter. You remember Matthew the 13th chapter? <clears throat> there are many short parables. Sorry about that, Miles. I'm not very techy here. There are many short parables. And have you noticed that all of these parables begin in the same way? That the kingdom of heaven is like. And so every one of these parables are told by Jesus to teach us something about the kingdom of heaven. And I love the simplicity of these teachings because, you know, when I don't really understand something and a teacher takes the time to say, well, let me talk with you about something you do understand and then show you how that is like this over here that you don't understand. So now you can have a better understanding. You're not getting too far away this time, are you? <laughs> well done. You're a quick study. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this short parable. It's one of the shortest parables of the Bible. And he says, another parable we put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in a field, which is the, the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. The Lord says, let me teach you something about the, the kingdom of heaven, the church on, on this earth. Let me teach you something about it. He said, you know how small a mustard seed is. You can put several mustard seeds on your thumbnail. And he says, but isn't it amazing that when you plant that tiny seed, it doesn't grow into just a little herb that, that's ankle high or, or knee high. He says, remember, it's the one that grows into more like a, a big shrub that's really kind of like a tree. A bird could come and, and nest in its branches. Imagine a bird trying to nest on a mustard seed. Kind of comical. But you plant it and it grows and now it can nest in that mustard tree. He says, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. He said, no, wait a minute, I read Acts 2. The kingdom of heaven started out pretty big on this earth. If, if you look at Acts 2, 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls wasn't big compared to the population of the world. And... The design of the church was to go to all the world, and it began in only one place. And so Jesus was prophesying here. This was before Acts 2. He's prophesying, and he's saying, sure, it's going to start out small compared to the world population. It's going to start out in one place. But just understand, by design, it will never stay that way. It's too powerful. The news is too good. People that love the Lord are going to go everywhere they go. And they're going to tell this message to others. So how does that growth take place? God never intended for the church you're a part of to stay the size it is. He never intended that. He always intended for us to be reaching out to others around us and to never stop. And the ones we reach out and bring in, they're to reach out to others and never stop. So how does this happen? It happens by that reaching out to others. Now let's read the shortest parable in the Bible. As far as I know, this is the shortest one. It's the very next verse, okay? Matthew the 13th chapter, verse 33. He's just talked in the previous two verses, a parable about the growth. And then he says, another parable he spoke to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leaven. All right, let's picture what Jesus is saying here. I want you to imagine you go into the kitchen and, and you make some bread dough. And the leaven is in the cabinet. You leave the leaven in the cabinet and the bread dough on the counter. You leave for a few hours and you come back. What does the bread dough look like? Well, it's probably dried up a little bit and it may even be a little bit smaller. All right, let's change that scenario. Let's make some bread dough and let's reach into the cabinet and let's let the leaven make contact with the dough. Now, let's let it rest for a while and let's come back in a few hours. What are we going to find? We're going to find that it has risen. It has expanded. It has grown. Listen, I grew up on a farm and my mom made a deal with us when we were little. She said, I'll, I'll cook 20 of the 21 meals a week. And so we had homemade breakfast, homemade lunch, homemade supper every day. Sunday morning breakfast was the only one she took off. She said, you'll eat cereal on Sunday mornings. Now, 
bread was vital. I grew up with biscuits and gravy every morning. A lot of time we'd have biscuits at lunch and, and or yeast rolls. And in the evening we would have some kind of roll or, or, or sourdough bread. My mom has had starter for sourdough bread that she feeds in the kitchen uh, refrigerator as long as I can remember. My mom for decades has made probably 6 to 12 loaves of sourdough bread a week. It's one of her ministries. She serves people. If you're a newcomer at church, she just naturally gives you a loaf of bread. If you're sick, she gives you a loaf of bread. If you're downhearted, she gives you a loaf of bread. And the reputation is well known around uh, that community. And, and people love it when they see her coming with that bread. Now, I can tell you that this verse right here that we've just read is a daily part of my growing up. I saw bread rising all the time on our little farm that I grew up in. I've seen mom take and put a clean dish towel over the top because it was rising so much she wanted to stop it from rising because it was spilling over. None of that happens without the contact of leaven. None of it. Lord, how do you want us to grow this church? It, it seems difficult. It, it seems confusing. And Lord would say, I just want you to go out to the people you're in contact with. There's not any single person here that will, by yourself, go to the whole world. But you can go to your world. What's the world you live in? What apartment? What street? Where do you work? Where do you go to school? Who are your circle of friends? Who is it that the Lord over this next week or this next month is going to open up doors of opportunity for you to, to meet someone that you've never met before? Listen, that's your world. That's the world that God is placing you in contact with those people. So that whenever they have any interest in learning more about where they came from, why they're here, and where they're going, you're there for them. You are their contact so that the Lord's people will grow and expand like a mustard seed. So how does this happen? What if, what if there was something much better today going on here than what we're doing at this moment? And what I mean by that, if, what if the speaker was the Apostle Paul? And what if Paul's topic was... I want to talk today about what causes a church to grow. Not what I think might be some great suggestions. The great Apostle Paul, speaking by inspiration, this is what causes the church to grow. I'd want to be right there on the front seat with Miles. I would love to hear Paul speak about, because keep in mind, he's like the king of church growth, right? This guy planted churches and grew churches all over the world of his day. And if you can teach us how to grow a church, I want to hear about it. And so, did you notice the scripture that has already been read capably this morning? Did you notice the last part of verse 16? Where he says, The whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part, that's you and I, every member of the body, does it share what causes growth of the body. I believe that all of the New Testament is important for us to understand, to live out, and in that sense, cause church growth. But here's what's pretty neat to me. There's not another passage in Scripture that I know of where it literally says this directly, with this kind of clarity. I don't know of another passage that says this is what causes a church to grow. That's one of the reasons why I love Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16. Paul talks about what a church is supposed to be from verse 1 all the way down to verse 16. And then he closes verse 16 and says, Now, if every member will do its share of what we just talked about in verses 1 through 16, this is what will cause the church to grow. Now, you know, in this limited time, we cannot study carefully verse by verse 1 through 16. 
But over the next few minutes, I want to give you a flyover of what Paul says causes a church to grow. And then maybe you want to go back on your own personal study. Maybe later on this year, you may want to, in a Bible class or, or whatever it may be, you may want to slow down and study these 16 verses very carefully. Because the church family needs to know when Paul says, if the whole church family does this, this causes growth of the body. We need to know what those verses say. So let's drop back. And notice what he says in, in verse 1, 2, and 3. He begins with our attitude. The individual's attitude in the church. And Paul is literally in prison as he writes this. And he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling of which you were called. What did it cost for you to be called to become a Christian? Christ dying on the cross. Do you walk worthy of that calling? Paul is writing from prison and he's making that urge. I beg you, I beseech you to walk worthy of that calling. And so you say, okay, I want to walk worthy of the calling. What does it look like? Verse 2, he says, it looks like this. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Isn't it interesting that he mentions four characteristics that are beautiful characteristics that if you and I had the opportunity to spend time with a person that had these characteristics versus someone that does not have these characteristics, we would choose every time to spend time with the people with these characteristics. What do I mean by that? By application. Someone comes and visits this congregation. Are they going to see people of humility? And lowliness. Why is humility beautiful? Arrogance says I'm more important than you. And I'm going to look down on you. Humility says you are more important than me. And I want to serve you. And lift you up. What do you need? A guest walks in for the first time. And visits here. Are they going to see a congregation. Of arrogance looking down on them. And really not even paying attention to them. Because I'm more important than you. Or are they going to see a church full of people where everyone believes that they deserve to be lifted up because they are greater than them? What a game changer. People will leave a place like that and say, I don't know what it is about those people. I've never been around people like that before, but I want to go back. I want to be around them again. Gentleness, sometimes translated meekness. It has nothing to do with weakness. Gentleness, perhaps the best way to understand gentleness and meekness. I, I grew up riding horses and I love horses and, you know, they're fast. They're a powerful animal. I want you to imagine a stallion running across a prairie. And, and I want you to see the strength of its neck and hear the thunder of its hooves and see how fast and powerful it is. Now let's bring that stallion in and let's break it. Let's, let's train that stallion, put a bit in its mouth. And now that same animal can run with a rider on its back just as fast and just as powerful, but this time it's under control. If we're gentle and meek, it means that God is taking all of the strength and ability that he's already given us, but we're handing the reins over to him to say, God, how do you want to use me? My same strength and, and my same abilities that you gave me. I've just noticed that when I keep the reins in my hands, I make a mess of things. I make terrible decisions. I offend people. I hurt people. I use people. But I've noticed when I put the reins in your hands, you make me an instrument of yours to bless people, to serve people, to lift people up. Can you imagine when everybody in the body serves each other and guests and those in the community with humility and with gentleness? Lord, I want to lift them up and I want you to use me in the way to do that. Oh, and by the way, the next one is a, whew, it's a tough term. Long-suffering. If you don't know what long-suffering is, just turn the two words around there. It means to suffer long. Who wants to sign up for suffering long? No one. But that's why becoming a Christian, the first thing Jesus said we had to do was what? Deny self. Take up the cross and follow me. I'm not number one. 
I'm not most important. The Lord's number one, and he says for me to treat you just as I would want to be treated. And you know what? We all come with baggage. And who's going to suffer long and bear one another's burdens? It'd only be those that sign up to say, I'm willing to suffer long. I'm not here for convenience. I'm not here for comfort. I'm here to serve you. And you know what? On top of that, we're imperfect people. Everybody in here. There's not anybody in here perfect. So you know what we're going to do? From time to time, we're going to offend each other. From time to time, we're going to say something we shouldn't have said. We're going to do something we shouldn't have done. And the question is, how are we going to treat each other when the other person has done that toward us? Are we going to be vengeful? Or are we going to suffer long, turn the other cheek, and be quick to forgive? And then look at the other that he says, bearing with one another in love. This idea of bearing with one another is literally, in the, in the Greek language, it's a shoulder up underneath the load. So you see someone bearing a load. The question is, are you going to be willing to say, let me help you bear that burden. Let me come and, and walk along beside you. What happens when a whole church family not only cares for each other with those four humble beautiful characteristics but what if everybody when you go to your workplace are you listening you go to your workplace tomorrow you go to your school tomorrow what if those same four characteristics describe you as you interact with everyone in other words they don't see you they see the love of Christ in you they don't see your fleshly nature they see you as a new creation in Christ. Hey, the old me wouldn't have been long-suffering with you at work like this. The old me would have scolded you and put you in your place. But now that I'm a child of God and a new creation, I suffer long with people in a way that I would never do. But since Christ is living in me, I'll suffer long with you. Oh, and I'll even help you bear that burden that you have. That's the kind of connection that people in the world could have with Christians that would cause the people in the world to say, I want to know more about what makes you the person you are. But notice that all of this is endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Notice he did not say to keep the Spirit of unity. That's totally two different things. Unity doesn't trump everything else. Truth and love trumps unity, but unity is found in the Spirit. So what if I submit to the Spirit... And what if you submit to the Spirit? Now you and I are unified, but it wasn't because we sat down and decided to be unified. We're unified because we're unified through the unity of the Spirit. It's like in verse 13 when he talks about the unity of faith. In other words, our unity must be found in the fact that we have fully submitted ourselves to God. And that's what unites us. Isn't it interesting that he talks about care here and how we treat each other? And that's the very first place he starts. Because I think a lot of us would think that maybe he would have started with verse 4, 5, and 6. And that is doctrine. I'm not suggesting to you doctrine is not important. Doctrine is very, very important. But if a church is going to grow, a church has to first show others how the teachings of Jesus have changed their lives. They have to show others how much they care. And then others will say, okay, I'm willing to listen. I want to hear the doctrine. I want to hear the teaching about this Jesus that's made you into a person that I've never seen a person like you before. And so what is the teaching? Obviously, he doesn't go into everything here, but he does give us a very difficult passage because he uses the word one. The most unique number there is. In other words, it's exclusive. If there's two of something, you can pick. Which one do you want? If there's only one, you don't have a choice to pick. You just submit or rebel. And so do you really believe it? When Paul says, let me tell you that there's seven things that there's only one of. Now the world around you is going to tell you there's many of these things. But he says, I'm telling you there's only one. And so he begins and he says, there's only one body. There's only one church. There's only one Holy Spirit. There's only one hope you're calling. You want to go to heaven? There's only one way to get there. There's only one Lord, one Jesus, one Messiah. There's only one faith. That's not your personal faith. That's the system of faith that comes by following the Word of God. Romans 10 17. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing from the Word of God. And so if I follow the Word of God and you follow the Word of God, we're part of the one faith. And then notice one baptism. Even though many... Christian faiths and even world faiths have baptisms. They have faith. They talk about hope. They talk about gods. 
The Lord takes all of these, including the last one there, God and Father, and says, there's only one of those. And so we have to submit our understanding to God's. Do I believe this? And am I willing to share this? Isn't it beautiful that the Godhead has given us a body and given us a faith, a system of belief? Isn't it beautiful that he's given us hope? Isn't it beautiful that he's given us a baptism that is the point in time that we enter into Christ and we leave the world and all of our sins are forgiven and we're walking in the light as he is in the light and his blood continually cleanses us each day. Listen, that doctrine is not only beautiful, it cannot be substituted. We must care for each other and all others if the church is to grow. But we also must have the right teachings. Do you realize if you change any of this, you might help someone become religious, but you're not helping them go to heaven. And that would be a terrible mistake. But notice as we go to verse 11 and 12, we talk about the right leadership. Notice in the first century, they had apostles that were selected by Jesus and had prophets with miraculous abilities. But once we leave those two, we have the rest here today. He gave some to be evangelists. He gave some to be pastors. And he gave some to be teachers. Now, it's interesting when we think even today, we have pastors, we have those that, that are uh, elders, and we think about the fact that we have teachers, and we have evangelists, we have preachers, and you say, what is the leadership in the Lord's church designed to do? And not that this would be a comprehensive list of everything, but isn't it interesting when you look at this passage, he says, let me tell you three things that they're for. Number one, they're for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, how do you equip saints? In second, uh, Timothy, the third chapter, verse 16 and 17, where we learn that all scripture is given by Inspiration of God is it's profitable for doctrine, for correction, instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, what? Thoroughly equipped to every what? Good work. Isn't that interesting? The Word of God is to equip saints for every good work. That's found throughout the Bible. And so the ultimate responsibility of leadership is to help the saints learn the Word of God so that they can learn where they can serve in the kingdom to build up the church. That's a mouthful. That's a lifelong journey. And that is the great responsibility of elders and preachers and teachers. Let's study God's word so that every one of us can learn how we can become better servants. So that we can help grow or edify the church. Listen, there's no such thing as a faithful Christian that's not serving in the body. No such thing. Faithful Christians are serving in the body. But those Christians, by God's design, need leaders that's helping them learn the way and live the way. So it starts with the leadership, and then it's the response of those who are following Finally, and as we close, I love verse 13 through 16 because it paints this beautiful picture of who we are to compare ourselves to. You know, we're to never stop growing in the faith. There may be some here that recently you became a Christian. That's awesome. And people may say to you, you, well, you need to continue growing. And that's true. But now let's talk to those that's been a Christian for 50 years. That's great you've been a Christian for 50 years. You are going to continue growing, right? There's no one here that's arrived. Every one of us are on this journey of maturation that we never stop growing. But now, put a time out there and we're going to come right back to that. You know what our human nature does though? Our human nature says, let me compare me to you. Now sometimes when I compare me to you, I, I get to feeling arrogant because I feel like I'm better than you. Then I compare me to you and I feel like, wow, I'm a loser because you're so much better than me. And social media hasn't made this any better. One of the worst things you can do for your own mental health 
is go through life comparing. We don't need to compare accomplishments. We don't need to compare material, uh, material items that we own. We don't need to compare personalities. We don't need to compare talents and abilities to each other. What do we need to do? Well, look at the end of verse 13. He says, I want you to compare yourself to Jesus Christ. My grandparents, both sides of the family, were farmers as well. And so imagine a country farmhouse in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee. And my grandparents on the Shannon side of the family, my grandmother had a little closet that she would keep the dirty laundry in before it went out on wash day. And, uh, and, and we got to do something in her house we didn't get to do in anybody else's house. We got to write on the wall. All of the grandkids could back up in that room and there was a place where you could stand and put a mark and you could put your age and, and the date and your name. And then all the other grandkids that were older than you, than younger than you, you could look at them and say, you know, you're, you're looking at, a, at a, a first cousin that's five years older than you and a lot taller than you. And you're able to say, I'm taller than you at your, when you were my age. And it was really cool. Now, you know, what we do, as I said previously, what we do is we go through life marking on everybody's wall. Hey, you see that? My car's better than your car. You see that? My job's better than your job. You see that? I got a promotion and you didn't. Horrible way to live. Horrible way to live. What if instead we back up and we measure ourselves every day? Just as verse 13 says. Against the stature of Jesus Christ. Now when I do that, you know what I, I learn every day? I learned two things. I have a lot of growing to do. And I have a lot of hope. Because the Lord's not looking down and saying, I can't believe that you're only where you are. Instead, when we look at the statue of Christ, we can hear Christ say, look what you're growing into. We get to look at Christ and we get to see our future. There's characteristics about Christ that, that I've not mastered yet, but through him I can and I can see what I can become. That's the same thing at the end of verse 15. When he says, speaking the truth in love. We've thought a lot about evangelism this weekend. Those two, you cannot sacrifice either of those. You can't speak the truth and be rude about it. You speak the truth in love. You can't speak the, tr the, the love and avoid the truth. We must speak the truth in love. But notice why we're doing that. That we may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. We're growing up into Christ. How? In all things. When you go home this afternoon, will you look like Christ in the way you interact with your family? When you go to work tomorrow or school tomorrow, will you look like Christ? Are you growing up in Christ in all things? When you think about the way you use your abilities, your talents, your resources, will you look like Christ? And will you be growing in Him in all things? That enemy that you have in your life, that they make your life miserable... Will you still look like Christ in the way you interact with, with them? The way you interact with difficult people? The next time someone harms you, will you look like Christ in your response? What we're not to look like in verse 14 is we're not to look like children. Now it's interesting, many times Jesus used children as a compliment to say that's what we ought to be. Kingdom of heaven is like this child. He's not using that here. Here he's not talking about the humility and the innocence of ch children. Here he's talking about the immaturity of children. And he's saying we ought to be growing up like Christ. End of 13. End of verse 15. And in the middle of those he puts 14. And then he says do not be like immature children. They believe whatever the last thing they heard. You ever seen a religious person that is very spiritually immature? And whatever book they've read last, they're on fire about it. And whatever podcast they heard last, they're on fire, fire about it. And whatever sermon they heard last. And, and half of those things that they're reading could be false in doctrine. And they're still on fire about it. That's what he's talking about in verse 14. He says, every wind of doctrine, it's like the children in a boat. and Just whatever current takes them, that's where they're going to go. And he says, your life should not be so unstable. Your life ought to be stable because your life is found in Christ. And you're growing up in Christ in all things. And you're speaking the truth. That grounds us. That's an anchor that steadies us in love. Now, where is all this leading? We can end where we begin. And that is, what if every part does its share? 
Notice the first part of this verse. We're joined and knit together. We see ourselves as one family, the family of God. And we see ourselves having great responsibility to each other and to those outside these walls. And what we do is we say, you know what? I want to do my share. I want to do my part. And when everybody does their part, they have the right attitude. They follow the right doctrine. They have the right leadership. And they respond to that leadership in a righteous way. And they have a right pathway of maturity. They measure themselves against Christ. Listen, it's not my opinion and it's not your opinion. The Lord through Paul says that is what causes the church to grow. What a beautiful, beautiful study that Paul gave to us to help us understand how to help the church grow. Do you realize there is no plan B? If Winnipeg is to hear about Jesus Christ, it's the Lord's church. And when you think about that, it's sobering. The Lord's not going to look down and see people looking for the Lord here, but nobody telling him and say, you know what? I'm just going to send Moses back. I'll just let him stay in Winnipeg just for six months or so to kind of get things going again the way it ought to be. He's not going to say, well, you know, I've got a plan B. I'm going to send one of the prophets back. You know, I'm going to send Jesus back to walk on the earth in Winnipeg just for a short while so that the people that are searching can know about him. He's not going to say, I'm going to resurrect the great apostle Peter or the apostle Paul. And, and that's my plan B. I want you to let this sink in real deeply. The Lord does not have a plan B for the people in Winnipeg to be reached that are looking for him. Except his church. That's plan A. And it's the only plan. We're to go into our world and preach the gospel. We are to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. The Lord's with us when we do it, but He won't do it for us. It has been an amazing, amazing blessing to me to be with you this weekend. I'm excited about the church here at Winnipeg. I'm excited in the future to see the great things that you will continue to do in the Lord's kingdom. Are we closing with invitation? So, if this morning we've spent a lot of time thinking about who we can be to reach out. I want you to think for a moment where we have to start in that is to say about us personally. What about you? It'd be hypocritical for you to say, I'm concerned about other souls if you haven't even surrendered your own soul to the Lord. And so there's a church family surrounding you right now saying, we want to encourage you. As a matter of fact, we're about to sing a song that we could call it a song of encouragement. And it's where, in essence, what we're saying, if, if you've never been baptized into Christ, why not this morning? If you understand the beautiful teachings of Jesus, why not respond this morning? Maybe you've become a Christian in the past and sin has separated you from God today. Let's not leave here. None of us leave here with sin separating us from God. We'd be honored to pray with you and for you as you repent and confess that sin. Let's all leave here this morning, not only united with the Lord, but united with each other. If we can help you in any way, let us know as we stand and as we sing. How deep the Father's love